kind of move. So Sarah, if you want to go first, that's awesome. Dog asleep. I mean, I can't say that. Yes, that's a perfect timing for me to go yeah. first. Yes. That sounds good. Um, all right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. I'm sure that people will continue to drift in as we go. Um, so this is the second in the series. We last time, hopefully some of you guys were here last time when we talked more about sort of the uh, abiotic factors and a basic overview of what we can kind of expect to see in terms of temperature and um and precipitation changes and things like that. And then we wanted to follow that up with a couple experts on diseases and insects to talk about what we might expect to see coming up from the South in, in terms of new diseases and insects. So we're going to start off today with Sarah Villani, who is going to talk about the disease side of things. Uh, I think most of you guys know Sarah, but she is now down with North Carolina State University. She has a 90% extension appointment and she focuses on diseases of apples and other woody ornamentals. So excited to hear what you have to say, Sarah. Cool. I'll go ahead and start watching the clock. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Um, coincidentally, it's probably as cold today in North Carolina as it is up in New York. So let me go ahead and share my screen so I don't make any blunders and we'll get rocking and rolling. Cool. All right, you can now see it. That looks okay. perfect. Okay, perfect, cool. All right, um, like I said, good good afternoon. I'm Sarah Villani, and we're going to talk about actually not just even the diseases or pathogens that are coming up there, but why they're going to get more intense for you. And so we'll, I'll give you some anecdotes of some of my experiences coming from upstate New York, working with Kara Cox and doing my PhD in Geneva with him. Um, to what I've encountered down here so far in North Carolina. So I've been here since late 2015, and I've had to sort of forget about scab research and transition to all the fruit rots and all the leaf spots, which has, has been a fun challenge for me. Okay, so the game plan for today is, you know, we're gonna talk, I wanna talk about some of the trends in the environment that I've seen here in North Carolina, and then give you some examples of some of the syndromes or some of the diseases and pathogens that, that we've been dealing with. And so the first is certainly erratic climate conditions. And so with that, I believe Jason Lundo spoke with you all last week and mentioned maybe some of the apple decline issues, but we'll go into what we've seen here in the, um, in the Southeast, as well as some of the opportunistic fungal pathogens that are associated with that. Okay. The other big um, change that I've noticed coming down south um, from the northeast are the extended growing seasons. And so what I mean is not just by the months, right, let's say from March until October, but also, you know, we have phenologies of the crop that might be more susceptible longer to certain diseases. Okay, so for example, um, powdery mildew. I never thought that I would see powdery mildew infection in September or October be very intense. But as you may know, powdery mildew has something called ontogenic resistance or trees become ontogenically resistant to powdery mildew. And basically that means that powdery mildew pathogen, it can infect old leaves, right? But here in the Southeast, our terminals don't set. They've set very briefly in late May and June, and then they start growing again. So. You know, it's not just the extended growing seasons, but that time where the tissue is susceptible to, to certain phytopathogens. And with that, you know, what I was going to discuss fire blight actually has been one of the major challenges for management here um, in the early spring. Okay, and then third, um, you know, I want to mention increasing low temperatures. So what are those increasing minimum temperatures usually that occur at night um, and increased precipitation? And, you know, with that, you get that that leaf wetness, dew, and those minimum temperatures, they might just be high enough here in North Carolina that we're getting more and more infection events occurring without rain, okay? And so a lot of our infection events are occurring during the nighttime when you get that combination of uh, the right temperature and, and leaf wetness, okay? But that certainly led to, for us, you know, more infection events, like I said, and that's led to more fungicide applications. Hopefully your do jaws don't drop. Some of you have heard me speak how often we have to spray here. But with that, I'm gonna give the example of glomerella leaf spot and bitter rot, and then a very rapid look at some of the other apple diseases here in North Carolina. Um, so just a quick couple of factoids um, to get us started. 
Here in North Carolina, we have an eight-month growing season for apples. Um, we hit green tip usually around the end of uh, February, so that's coming up soon. And then our final harvest was with Pink Ladies at the end of October. So having such a long growing season, something like Pink Lady is one of our earliest bloomers in early April. And we need to manage that crop through October. And Pink Lady is, you know, um, susceptible to several rots, particularly bitter rot and the leaf spot associated with it here, glomerella leaf spot. And so, you know, that's a real challenge when it comes to efficacious fungicides, meeting annual limits of fungicides, um, and also resistance management for sure. And we do have liberal utilization of frost protection. And unfortunately, it gets cold enough here that the windmills won't even help or the wind machines won't even help, I should say. Um, but, you know, we bloom here in early April usually. Sometimes, actually, last year it was late March, March 25th. And then our average last frost here in Henderson County is April 24th. And so, you know, given that critical time where, you know, blossoms at 28 degrees Fahrenheit, I believe, I don't have it completely memorized there, but basically, you know, it doesn't take that low of a temperature to cause considerable damage to blossoms. Okay, so we'll talk about that. Um, so here's kind of um, where we're at now with fungicide applications. The fewest that I can count that I've put on in a season for good control of bitter rot, and that was on Gala, 19 applications of fungicides with 13 cover applications. That doesn't include streptomycin for fire blight. But really, most cultivars are getting 25 plus fungicide applications per season at this point. And something like a pink lady apple will get easily 35 to 40 applications. And so it's really important that you don't let the, that coverage slip, right? Because if you do and you're halfway through the season or getting into late August, uh-oh, you just thrown a lot of money down the toilet and flushed it because, you know, you're, you're, the, the crop is still really susceptible throughout the season. And then last week, we, get, we tend to get the worst of the north and the worst of the south. And so, you know, we get all of the northern diseases here, apple scabs, either apple rust, powdery mildew. Oh, I don't know what else. You can just keep going fly speck, sooty blotch. So we get all of those. And then we get the southern diseases, historically southern diseases. So the fruit rots, um, black rot, white rot, bitter rot, um, alternate area leaf spots, another one. And so it really creates a real man management debacle um, trying to figure out, you know, our, our, our timings there. Okay. Now, I'm a pathologist. Everyone loves to show the disease triangle. My colleagues were making fun of me today because I'm like, oh, I guess I should put a disease triangle in here. But, you know, I just want to point out a few things. You know, in order to get a, a disease to occur, right, it's, I would argue it should be a fairly rare event um, because, number one, you need to have a susceptible host, right? And with a susceptible host, it doesn't just mean that the pathogen can infect that host. Um, it also means that the host phenology or growth stage needs to be susceptible. So with something like fire blight, you're not going to get blossom blight infection when you're at pink bud. You need open blossoms for that. And so if you have a protracted bloom or extended bloom period, that can mean a really, really long stage for susceptibility. Same thing with, you know, um, expanding shoots. If your terminals don't set and they keep growing, that makes you increasing susceptibility. You have an increasing susceptibility for fire blight, powdery mildew, and many other pathogens that like to infect that young succulent tissue. All right. Next deal here, you need to have, you know, the consider the availability of the pathogen. And so I would argue that, you know, most of our pathogens that we have here in North Carolina They've been found as far as New York, right? And so they're not really anything different. Um, it, it's pretty much the same. But the bottom line here is that the pathogen needs to be available and it needs a means to spread. So, for example, with fire blight, bees can be poll or bees pollinators can be pollinating flowers, such as the honeybee there, and you know pick up some bacterial ooze or some fire blight cells, right, or winnia cells, and kind of bring them from flower to flower to flower. And like Carrick showed with his research um, in, in Grey Globe, that certainly, you know, black flies can also be attracted to these sticky sweet ooze, and they can bring in vector, you know, casually um, that bacterium as well. I think the biggest thing that's going to be changing is, is certainly the conducive environment um, for infection events, for germination of a fungus, and for infection events, right? And so that environment's going to affect, again, affect, again, things like, you know, um, susceptibility, um, the, the length of susceptibility, the availability of the pathogen. Um, what else here? 
um, generations, right? Secondary cycles of the pathogen. It's going to infect residues if it's raining a lot. Um, so all those things. Okay. So let's go ahead and, and just kind of move on. So for example, looking at rising um, the environment, this morning I went ahead and I put together this table here. Um, this is the minimum temperatures um, in 2023, and this is Mills River where I'm located in Geneva, New York. It's a bit confusing on this one, but this is basically the um, the daily low temperature from March all the way March 1st all the way through the end of October. Okay, with uh, Mills River here in North Carolina in red and Geneva in yellow, and you can sort of see from this for for the most part that you know perhaps Mills River has a higher average low temperature, but or daily low temperature I should say, but you know. Looking at it a little bit more closely, when I look at the, the low temperatures per month um, or the minimum temps per month, in general, Mills River is either the same or warmer, right? And it might only be by a factor of three, four degrees monthly, but that may be enough, right, to make um, infections event more frequent, okay? It might bring it into more of an optimal temperature for a pathogen to infect. So that's actually fairly considerable. And I believe George Sundin's group and, and, and over at Michigan has been doing quite a bit of work on this, looking at low temperatures and how they're rising even within the state over the years. Okay, now moving on to some of the, uh, the issues here. And I, I think most of you here are probably familiar with rapid apple decline or sudden apple decline. And, you know, this is a problem that we've all been facing, I would argue, throughout the eastern United States, at least, and somewhat into the north central region as, as well there. Um, this tree here on the left, um, that's a tree that's going under going under early decline. So the tree um, came out of winter fairly normal. Uh, the growers had no complaints. It was the leaves were were the normal dark green. Um, terminals were uh, terminals were expanding, and then around June or so, the tree started to develop more chlorotic foliage, and then within two weeks. Um, these trees were in this area were becoming more and more red leaf and then complete collapse of the tree and, and death there, right? And so you're very familiar with this. It's, it's happening most often in young high density orchards here in North Carolina. We haven't necessarily seen an association with, with the scion or the cultivar nor the rootstock. But again, you know, Jason, again, I think mentioned some of this last week from what I caught on the YouTube video. But, you know, really what we've seen here is necrosis or death at the graft union. And so I'm not going to pretend to be a climatologist or a physiologist here. Um, but the interesting thing is that there's there's no death really below the soil line. And the roots are, for the most part, looking healthy. Same deal above the graft union. Um, we've seen some progression of necrosis. But for the most part, that's fairly healthy tissue there um, until the tree kind of gives up the ghost. And these symptoms have been similar throughout Pennsylvania. Uh, New York, here in North Carolina. And, you know, when you see a pattern like this, you start to wonder, you know, could this be cold injury? You know, the Graft Union region is one of the last parts of the tree to acclimate toward winter. Down here below the soil line, it's somewhat insulated. Here in North Carolina, we don't get any snow to insulate this area up here. And so that certainly could be, you know, sort of the considerations. How much is cold injury um, impacting a uh, rapid decline in death of the trees? Okay. So, you know, with rapid apple decline, you know, we've had a number of us scientists looking at it and none of us have a real answer, even though we've poured in hundreds of thousands of dollars in trying to figure out this problem. But what we've come to is really, it, it seems to be a combination of abiotic stress um, with biotic stress factors factored in there. Okay, and so for the most part, let's go through some of the abiotic stressors real quick here. Um, certainly cold damage is one of those, as I was mentioning. This tree on the left here, this is our wonderful frost protection that we have to do every spring pretty much when we get a freeze during bloom. But this graph here is in Celsius, but it's showing the uh, North Carolina minimum temperatures. We first saw apple decline here in North Carolina in 2016 to 2017. And for the most part, it only gets to about minus 12 uh, Celsius below zero. And that's at a point where the tree should be fairly well acclimated to the cold right there in January. Um, and really, this line here um, signifies where, you know, you'd start to see damage to the tree or death of the tree from cold injury. And here in North Carolina, we don't really come close to that line, maybe toward March or April when the tree is beginning to come out of dormancy. But for the most part, we're, we're well above that with our temperatures. But when I talk about erratic climate conditions, you know, one of those, those the things that I observe here that I didn't in New York, 
are certainly the fluctuations, those rapid fluctuations in temperature at critical times for the tree's um, survival. So for example here, this here is December 2016 on, on the bottom uh, x-axis here in temperature, this time in degrees Fahrenheit, so we can all understand it better. Um, and basically the red line is the high temps and the low line is the daily low temps. And you can see that within a matter of, you know, three days at 80% defoliation, we're going from 60 degrees to about 15 degrees Fahrenheit. So about a 45 degree temperature change within that time. And furthermore, you know, the leaves, the trees still have quite a bit of leaves, about 20% of their leaves wet. And we have this pattern all throughout December as the tree probably is not fully acclimated to the cold weather. Now, as the tree's coming out of dormancy, this is quite frequent here in North Carolina, where we start to see those fluctuations again in March and early April, where we're going from 70 degrees Fahrenheit to about 15. So this time about a 55 degree um, change in temperature over like a three to five day span. So again, that's a lot of fluctuations of freezing, thawing, freezing, thawing as well there. And, you know, we've been seeing a lot of Southwest injury and so forth. Um, let's see here, other stressors. Uh-oh, going too far ahead of myself. One second here. Cool. So, you know, other stressors that, that we've seen here in North Carolina, um, forest fires. This was new to me uh, coming down south, but, you know, this was either the Gatlinsburg or Pigeon Forge. I can't remember which fire that was, but it, it spread throughout the, the western part of the state back in autumn of 2016. And this here is one of my Gala Research Orchards, and you can see the smog. Um, so, you know, it was very, very dry. We had a similar fall this year. We're finally catching up on rain now. But, you know, the soil moisture um, was in a bad zone for it, okay? So it was pretty dry. And so, you know, that could certainly be a stress. It's been documented that Botrysferia dithidia, the white rot pathogen of, of trees, actually prefers dry conditions, right? And so that certainly could be a predisposing factor for some of these opportunistic pathogens. We also see quite a bit of flood stress. There's been a lot of rain here. And so, you know, this has been studied quite a bit in ornamentals, but also with apples, you know, we're doing a lot of work and Tom Kahn's lab is doing a lot of work here right now, trying to better understand the real, you know, how water, which rootstocks perform best under certain water stress conditions. Okay, but, but certainly flood stress can cause, you know, heightened susceptibility and availability of pathogens as well, such as Phytophthora, um, causal agent of crown and uh, crown and collar rot, as well as root rot. Okay, so for us, you know, I wanna focus on biotic factors. So number one is ambrosia beetles here. And so with rappled apple decline here in the Southeast, um, ambrosia beetles have been quite prevalent and associated with the apple decline. So, you know, I, I equate ambrosia beetles sometimes to myself in college when I moved into an apartment near Frat Row. I was under 21 years old but we all wanted alcohol at the time and none of us had fake IDs. And so what we do is kind of sense out the ethanol, right? And sense out the alcohol. And that's what ambrosia beetles do too. So when trees are stressed, um, they produce ethanol and that serves as a volatile, as an attractive volatile for these ambrosia beetles. Once they sense um, the ethanol, they can really zero in on a tree. And so here is evidence or a sign of ambrosia beetle activity in a um, on a tree in a high density orchard. You can see here this to this sawdust toothpick coming out. Um, that's not actually the frass of the insect. They don't actually eat the tree. Um, what they do instead is that they cultivate and then munch on their symbiotic fungus. And so ambrosia beetles are really cool. They have this um, pouch between the, uh, the head and the, I guess it would be the abdomen. Um, at least these ambrosia beetles do and it carries a symbiotic fungus. And so in order for the ambrosia beetle to reproduce, to survive, to feed, lay eggs, et cetera, this symbiotic fungus needs to be present. And it actually, through some of our research, um, is more competitive in ethanol-rich environments than other, let's say, endophytic fungi that, or opportunistic fungi that might be chilling out in the tree, right? And so basically the ambrosia beetle's berries in, sets up its fungal colony, and then the offspring um, mate with each other and out emerges a female to live another day and to cause more destruction. Okay. So what does this have to do, you know, with, with, um, with the, uh, the warming climate in the South? So in New York, Arden Yellow did a lot of ambrosia beetle trapping with Debbie Breath um, when she was in, uh, I think it was Janet's position actually. Um, 
but we did he did a lot of trapping and you know identified one primary ambrosia beetle xylosandris germanus known as the black stem borer okay here in north carolina we've been trapping for a number of years this is just an example um, of the phenology of ambrosia beetles during 2019. The way we trap for them are using ethanol lures in this double soda bottle trap. And so basically the ambrosia beetles are attracted to the ethanol and then they fall into this sort of catch liquid down here. Um, the deal here in North Carolina is that, you know, we weren't just seeing Xylosandrus germanus, but we were seeing other ambrosia beetle species as well, in particular Xylosandrus cresciusculus. And there's a new one called Nestus mutilatus as well. And so, you know, with our with our warming climates, you know, we're seeing a greater diversity of these ambrosia beetles as we're moving south. And I'll show that on, on the next slide as well. But also we're having to deal with the flight timings, right, of each of these ambrosia beetles. This year they were fairly in line, but there's other years where they've been separate as well. And so that certainly has implications for managing these beetles. Um, and I'm sure Anne's going to talk much more about this. I'm not an entomologist. I just moonlight as one sometimes. Okay. Um, and then we're starting to see greater diversity here in the Mid-Atlantic region, I guess the Mid-Atlantic slash early Southeast region. You know, this is, we um, did a collaborative project um, through an SARI project um, with some, with New York all the way down through Georgia um, with ambrosia beetle trapping. And we looked primarily at Xylosandrus germanus and Crassiusculus, other species, of course, were trapped during that time. But you can see as we start to move south here, we're seeing a greater diversity of ambrosia beetles in a change of species as well. And so that might have implications again on insecticide efficacy, um, timing and, and so forth with that. Okay. So I mentioned that, you know, these ambrosia beetles have these symbiotic fungi, but they also have the potential to vector in pathogens, sort of like a hitchhiking ride. So it's not like they're like getting their, their tongue or their probe and pushing it in, but certainly their exoskeleton there can certainly pick up some fungal spores or mycelium and then bring them or introduce them into the tree. And that's sort of our main concern is, you know, can they introduce pathogens that could be detrimental to the tree and cause infection throughout the tree, especially on trees that are compromised, right? And so, you know, we did a big um, survey, over 2,700 isolates evaluated, fungal isolates evaluated, identified and then evaluated. Okay, and what we did, I don't have a great, I don't want you to memorize this completely. Um, this is meant to just kind of be complicated here. But we looked at trap beetles, so that we're in live traps, so that we could just take them and get the fungi off of them and see what was there. Sentinel trees, where basically these trees were growing in containers, they were healthy. But then we would, what we would do is drench them with an ethanol solution, about two and a half percent, flood that, and then bring it out to a wooded edge for a week or two. Okay, so we'd artificially sort of stress them to attract ambrosia beetles. And then lastly, we went through orchards and took trees, you know, sampled from trees that were in decline, but didn't have any evidence that we could find of ambrosia beetle tunneling or any sort of activity there. Okay, and so the sentinel trees, most of those fungi, I should say, came from the beetle galleries themselves there. And what we find is really not totally a surprise. Um, you know, with the trap beetles and the sentinel trees, we were able to isolate more really frequently the ambrosiella, that's the symbiotic fungus, no big deal. Um, but in trees that were more compromised due to you know, some abiotic stressors that were or were not identified, you know, we were able to find Botrysferia, Diaporthy, and a lot of these opportunistic pathogens that no one's really studied all that much as far as how they um how their biology is with the wood or their ecology with the wood, right? And it's a pain in the butt to do it. Okay, and then the other deal we found a lot of all across though, more than anything else were fusarium species. And those are really understudied, I would argue, until recently in apples. And so fusarium solani um, can be certainly a pest in, uh, let's see here, potatoes, right? Or not a pest, but a pathogen, and pathogenic in potatoes. But we really don't know about which strains or which species can be problematic for apples yet. Okay. So it's great that we identified all of these, but then we wanted to test the aggressiveness of these fungal isolates. Can they infect an apple? And number two, how aggressive are they? Do we need to worry about them? And so we did a number of studies on detached shoots where we introduced the pathogen. Um, we did some greenhouse studies on seedlings. And then we looked at the zone of necrosis, basically, to determine as a sort of a proxy for, for isolate aggressiveness there. And this is just an example to show you what we've done. But we tested a number of isolates either within a species or a number of strains there. And then we also tested a number of different species. 
Okay, so what we can kind of ascertain, again, these were done on healthy trees as an initial screen. Okay? But what we can ascertain that, yeah, Fusarium solani can be sort of nasty. Some strains could be worse than others. Okay, Fusarium armenia, I can't even pronounce it. Definitely quite aggressive, that strain at least on apples. But Vatrospheria in a stress-free, relatively stress-free environment other than growing in a container really didn't do much damage. And so the next stage of all of this is we've got um, a postdoc with uh, Tom Kahn on our SERI project. And we're going to start to introduce these pathogens, anti-ambrosia beetles, in these uh, abiotic stress sort of events. So we've just purchased some freezers that we can go ahead and kind of use to simulate cold injury. Um, and then we've also got the whole flooding stress and drought stress sort of figured out at this point how to impose it without directly killing the tree as well. So we're pretty excited about that. Okay. Next, um, so that's the ambrosia beetles rapid apple decline. Next, I just want to mention, you know, extended growing seasons and, you know, how that influences fire blight management. So as many of you know, fire blight can infect many parts of the tree. Well, Rhinia amylava can infect many parts of the tree. So here's canker blight right here. That's a nice canker um, that will provide inoculum for the following season. Certainly we have blossom blight here that started to go into the shoot. You see this wonderful ooze here. There's millions or billions of Rowenia amylava cells within each of those little ooze drops. And then of course, shoot blight as well, which can influence vigor of the tree. And also you can see that canker right here that's formed due to the migration of the pathogen, the bacterial pathogen there. So for those of you who are not as familiar with fire, with blossom blight, we've got some models to, um, to predict or to help us, to help guide us when we're going to apply an antibiotic such as streptomycin or even a biological. Um, so basically, you know, using the, the Mary Blight model for me is the easiest to explain to you. It's available, a version of the Mary Blight on NUA. Um, but really, here's the deal here. You need to have four conditions met. The first is that flowers need to be open with intact petals. Okay, so you can't have it at pink bud and really anytime far after petal fall, you're not gonna be able to infect those blossoms either. You need an accumulation of degree hours above 65 degrees uh, Fahrenheit and that's for that epiphytic inoculum potential. So what's cool about fire blight, Erwinia amylavra, is that it hangs out on the stigmatic surface for a while, right? Okay, and those degree hours, those, those warming temperatures keep it from multiplying, or, allow it to multiply, right? And encourage multiplication of the pathogen there. And they'll hang out happily until you get a wedding event, such as dew or rain, or even fungicide or insecticide sprays as well, can kind of push that pathogen into the nectar thoats, and all of a sudden you've got blossom blight. And then of course you wanna have an average temperature above 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see there here in North Carolina, we tend to meet most of those conditions. So increasing concerns of blossom blight in here in North Carolina, this is just a snippet from last year. Um, again, we had bloom begin on March 25th and end, I believe it was April 27th, um, but that's a lot of days for a blossom, for blooms to be going on gala, right? Back in New York, it was only like a five day period that we had to deal with that, with bloom a lot of the time. I remember Carrick and I having to do a blossom blight trial and we'd be like, all right, well, we've got to go spray for 20% bloom according to the protocol that we had. And then the next day we had to go spray 80% bloom. It's not like that most of the time here in North Carolina. It's a very slow progression. Okay, and with that, you know, kasuma, kasuga mycin, kasuma doesn't work too well. I think it's because it photodegrades and we get a lot of sun here compared to upstate New York. But here, any of the red means we have an infection event. Okay, this is a snippet from NUA. Let's say I go ahead and I spray strep on April 18th. Great, oh no, all of a sudden now, I took care of April 18th, but man, I'm at high risk still for an infection event from April 19th onwards into the 23rd. So now the next day I'm gonna go, two days later, I'm gonna go out and spray strep. Give me hopefully a little bit of kickback activity, we'll see. But basically that, that long infection period took at least two sprays of streptomycin. Okay, and that's within a five or six day period. We have 30 something days of bloom. And so certainly worrying about antibiotic resistance is a concern for us. Um, we had four freezes during gala bloom this year. And the other thing that happened is rat tail bloom for us. And so these flowers still can be susceptible. Um, usually you won't spray strep. Usually we encourage something like a biological to control for this. But you can see the fruit here, the fruitlets, and there's our bloom still, still happily coming out. Okay. 
So again, streptomycin works great for us here. Um, this is incidence of blossom blight, 2017 through 2020. It's still king for us here in North Carolina. It basically resulted in 0% incidence here in the red in 2019 and 2020 of blossom blight, whereas we had really good disease pressure um, during those years in our uninoculated, or excuse me, in our inoculated untreated control there. The problem comes in is that we can't keep spraying streptomycin. I don't like to spray it more than four times a year because I don't want to end up like Michigan or Washington State or other regions. And so I particularly don't because we really don't have many great options for biologicals here. So here's an example of the um, variability of performance of biologicals. Okay, so George Sundin in Michigan and I had a grant um, to evaluate bacteriophage um, for blossom blight, and we looked at agrophage. And you can see here, we had 0% to 64% um, blossom blight control, a huge variable range there. And I can promise you that 0% was yours truly orchard right here. But you can see the same deal here is that, you know, we see this huge range of variability. Our inoculated controls in all situations tend to be fairly equivalent across New York, Michigan, um, or North Carolina state. But we're seeing a huge variability though, when it comes to biological performance. Okay, and here are some examples. Uh, these are CAREX trials in the red New York um, and ours here in North Carolina in the yellow. Okay, and this is reduction, percent reduction in blossom blight incidence. And so, and here in the parentheses is basically the, inc or it is the incidence of blossom blight on the control, on the inoculated control. So one thing to point out is that either CAREX orchard for the most part, um, had, or in two years had higher incidence on the uh, on the control or the untreated check than I did, okay, with the exception of 2020 there. But in all years, Carrick Sarchard in New York there, he was able to achieve high levels of control compared to and to compared to North Carolina using Serenade Opti, Opti which is a bacillus. Okay. Here in North Carolina, or here again with Agrifage, this is again now comparing New York. Uh, Michigan and North Carolina, so Michigan here is in blue. Again, the, the numbers in parentheses represent the percent incidence of, um, of blossom blight. And you can see this is not missing. I had 0% control with agrophage back in 2019. And really, it's just been terrible here. Again, CARES had excellent activity in New York. And Michigan's done, in general, better than North Carolina, but, but still not great. And so, you know, certainly the environment is certainly affecting likely how these biologicals perform. And we've got a, we've got right now um, an SERI project also looking at uh, modeling some of these environmental factors and um, control with these biologicals. Okay, lastly here, because I don't want to take um, too much time here, um, but I guess we have it. So the last thing here is I want to mention, you know, these increasing low temperatures and increased precipitation and use bitter rot as an example. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, back in 1902, more than 100 years ago, uh, T.J. Burrell from Illinois you know, made this comment, and you can find it in the literature, that there's no disease, other disease, so enormously destructive to the apple fruit as is the one commonly called bitter rot. Okay, and in 1902, in the Illinois production apple production region, they had 1.5 million dollars worth of losses. Um, and actually, that was 1900 due to bitter rot. That's insane. That's, you know, now that's worth that 1.5 million in today's dollars, $400 million um, law, worth of losses from the bitter rot outbreak. Okay, so it could be huge. Now, the, the pathogen that's primarily causing bitter rot in the, um, in the Northeast is um, in, in the species complex, Colototricum acutatum. Okay, and so these are just classic symptoms here of bitter rot, where you see these concentric lesions or these lesions that you know grow concentrically, sort of like a bullseye, I would say, and then they form these orange to salmon-colored conidia, or just for easy sake, um, we'll just call them spores here. But the deal with the Colototricum acutatum is that it's ideal growing conditions, about 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Doesn't mean that it can uh, it can infect and cause infection at a lower or higher temperature. That's just the optimal range. And this this species complex is known for more for causing disease on fruit than it is on foliage. That's not to say you can't find it in foliage, it just doesn't cause symptoms, um, species in that this complex. Okay. Here in North Carolina, we deal with something called glomerella leaf spot and a bitter rot that's associated with that. Same genus, but different species 
causing this problem. Okay, so this is the species complex called Calotatricum gliosporides. I can actually spell it now, and my spell checker catches it for me when I can't. Okay, um, really the ideal temperature for infection is 85, 86 degrees Fahrenheit. That's darn hot. But the pathogen can also infect at 55, 56 degrees Fahrenheit as well. Okay, and so, yes, you certainly have the species up in the Northeast, you just don't have it that frequently because it's just not as good of infector, okay, at uh, at those low temperatures there. Okay, with uh, gliosporides, it can infect both vegetative and fruit tissue. And so here's an apple. This is the um, this is a gala apple. This is an early infection. You can sort of see this depressed lentil cell here. All right, as the disease progresses, um, the tissue begins to become macerated, and by harvest, it's a full rot. What you don't see as much with the gliosporides complex or abundant acervuli um, and canidia, okay? Where I think a lot of our secondary inoculum comes from is actually the leaf stage. And so, as I mentioned, these species, these species can also cause um, a leaf spot. So you have this purple fleck, that's the early symptoms, sort of looks like an insect feeding damage or even like spray injury there. Okay, and as the lesions expand, they become more centric, have this purple line border. And then the leaf really becomes even more spectacular, I'd argue, than, uh, than cedar apple rust. The real issue comes in um, if you can't manage it properly. And so this is July 15th, 2019, it's not October. And you can see here on the scale tree that, you know, an effective fungicide application, we really were able to, to keep Glomerella um, at bay here. But an ineffective fungicide application, definitely um, this premature defoliation does have a lot of consequences. We weren't sure at first the extent of it, but, I, but right now into my sixth year or seventh year doing research in this orchard, this orchard has severely declined since Glomerella research began. And there's certain trees you can tell that that are likely declining because the tree is um, probably did not have the right carb reserves because it couldn't do photosynthesis fully like it should have with the leaf fall. And likely there was a lot of winter injury. And now we're seeing a lot of Botrysferia obtusa um, causing a tree, you know, hastening tree decline. Okay. Um, real quickly here, because I want to finish up, but um, how do we got a handle on this glomerella leaf spot and bitter rot? So most of the growers here in North Carolina before I came were spraying very similarly to what you would do in the Northeast on 14 to 21 day application intervals and usually capped hand with maybe a DMI thrown in there once in a while or a strobularian. Um, but again, those were 14 to 21 day intervals or unless it rained two inches, okay? And they had really no clue on efficacious fungicides or fungicide timing, okay? So what we wanted to know is, you know, what are the most efficacious fungicide classes for the management of glomerella leaf spot in bitter rot in North Carolina? And so what we did is we looked at uh, different frat groups with this. And I, I just want to point this out. Um, I don't, for the purpose of this talk, really care if you know which ones are efficacious or not. That doesn't matter. Um, what matters, I want you to follow here, is this 11 to 18 spray interval. I didn't have a technician in 2017, and I was backpacking myself. And there's no way I could have survived. Um, going every seven to 10 days. But in 2018, I did have a technician. And so basically what we've learned here is that, and, and this has been repeated year after year after year, but what we've learned is that, you know, in order to get commercial levels of control for bitter rot and glomerella, we need to be spraying on a seven to 10 day interval. And that's one uh, change our growers have definitely had to make with the, um, with the establishment of this disease here in North Carolina. Okay. And then secondly, you know, should fungicide applications for glomerella and bitter rot management begin prior to July? So that's really like the third cover spray, maybe fourth here for us. And are 14 day fungicide applications during summer adequate if there's no rain? Okay, so this is a, a grower. Uh, I would consider him probably one of the best growers here in North Carolina. Um, but he, uh, this was a year we had a, we had a pretty bad freeze during bloom. It was uh, 2021, I believe. And he, um, he ended up getting a lot of glomerella leaf spot and bitter rot on his Granny Smith. And so I asked him to send me his spray schedule. He's like, Sarah, I've been spraying every seven to 10 days. And then he sent this to me. And I'm like, you know, grower, you've spread, you had 20 days in between this, 14 and 15 days in between the June and July. So, you know, there's there's been a, a real lapse. Okay. Well, he says, Sarah, I didn't get two inches of rain. I thought that was fine. And he didn't. I mean, it really wasn't a particularly rainy period in between there. 
But I will say that something like glomerella leaf spot um, is a really explosive disease, sort of like bacterial spot on peach, okay? Where once, you know, I don't think that managing or, or modeling the, the pathogen biology is really the way to go here. Um, we're actually modeling residues now at this point to help better inform growers. But really, you know, infection criteria that, you know, I've, I've been able to work into developing some models here anyway, you know, it's between 59 and 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, leaf wetness hours, you only need about 2.76 hours, and the relative humidity needs to be 95%. And here in North Carolina, in the evening, during night, we really often have all of those conditions met. So within that 20-day period, um, we had six min a minimum of six infections. I was pretty conservative in calling these infections. Between this 14-day period, nine infection events. Okay, so there was a lot, a lot of fungal inoculum there as well. So kind of keep that in mind there. And with that, I've already spent my time. And so I just wanted to leave you with a bunch of other diseases that we have to contend with. Black rot has been considerably bad lately, likely because we've had to stop front loading our caftan and back loading it to cover sprays, which has led to more frog eye leaf spot early on and more blood rot and so forth. And, and so, you know, this is just a, a glimpse into the future and I'd be happy to take any questions now or let Ann roll and then we can take questions at the end. Cool, but I'm gonna shut up now. I'm sorry for going over, but- No, ahead. wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. really interesting. I feel like maybe we should keep going with Anne and then save all the questions for everyone. That sounds for great, yeah, end. we're hanging around. Thanks. Perfect, thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah, for talking about all the insects. <laughs> I'm not talking about black stem borers, so that was really great. Good. I don't know what I'm doing half the time with it, but I had a grad <laughs> student. Um, we, the population, we have issues with it here for sure. Mostly the, um, not the black stem borer, the, um, the, um, crescent, crescent, cresculata, crescent calcula, whatever, the brown one. <laughs> and, uh, but the populations are so sporadic. Anytime we have an orchard to go, monitor at they disappear and then they pop up someplace else so they do what insects do best all right can you see everything okay? looks great all right well i uh thank you so much for having me here uh i see some familiar names on the screen so uh it's great to see that uh so i was asked to kind of talk about the thoughts on eastern tree fruit pests um as we move forward. And so a lot of what I'm gonna talk about right now is speculative, um, which is just kind of the nature of the beast right now. But it does so happen that um, two things have happened. One, I, okay, there we go. Um, you know, in our Eastern tree fruit orchards, we do, uh, we, we do have to manage our pests. Uh, typically we do this in an IPM or integrated pest management situation. Um, and this does frequently involve insecticide applications. We can be smart about the way we apply our insecticides by using degree day models to time our pests and you know, biologicals where, where appropriate and even just kind of more spatially refining our pest management applications. But that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. What I think are the major threats facing our industry as a whole are invasive species. We've had quite a few in the past few years. Um, so primarily being uh, brown marmorated stink bug, which is my baby. Um, so I enjoy working with that species. And now we have spotted lanternfly, which is not a problem in tree fruit, uh, thankfully. But we've also had spotted winged drosophila as a pest in, you know, cherries. Um, so, you know, we're kind of waiting to see what the next invasive species will be. We do have a lot of persistent native pests that now in the past, you know, 15, 20 years that the invasive species have gotten, I don't want to say under control, but those outbreak populations have declined. Now we have, along with changes in insecticide practices, these persistent native species are popping up and saying, you don't forget about us, we're still here. And in fact, they are rising to the top in terms of our pest problems. There's been a lot of regulatory changes, as I'm sure y'all know, uh, especially pertaining to uh, you know, deregistration of pesticides and, of course, pollinator protection. Um, and this has really changed, forced some changes in the way we manage our pests, uh, some possibly for the better with a larger adoption of mating disruption, um, uh, which is more environmentally benign. 
And there's supposed to be another thing here. There you go. Climate change. <laughs> um, we're seeing this happen a lot. And what we're seeing a lot of issues with climate change, especially in peaches, New Jersey is the fourth largest producer of peaches in the country. Uh, so, and they're all for fresh market. They're not for processing. So, you know, while we do grow apples in the Northern part of the state, the Southern part of the state where I'm located is dominated by peach production. Um, and we're seeing a lot of changes in, in our growers, grower communities. Some are ripping them out for houses. Some are ripping them out for uh, wineries. Um, it's getting more and more expensive to grow peaches. Um, and part of that is because about every other year, every three years, we get a severe frost and we lose a significant portion of our peach crop and sometimes our apple crop as well. Um, and so these kind of early springs that we have, the trees wake up from dormancy and the, you know, they start, um, they start blooming and then we get a late, not really even a late frost, a normal time frost, and we tend to lose a lot of our crop. Um, so, and this does impact the insects. Um, however, you know, accumulating that data is a little harder to piece out. So fortunately, we are in the process of putting together a large SCRI project on updating IPM programs for tree fruit in the Eastern US. Uh, now, Eastern is very generous. Uh, it's kind of more east of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, but as part of this, what we did was we did a um, a pest survey of growers. So we did a Qualtrics survey to, you know, there's 20 questions or so, and we're trying to identify what the key pests are and what the key management issues are for these pests. And when we did this survey, we had over 100 responders. The majority of these uh, responders, these are all growers. They're not crop consultants um, or, you know, industry or, um, you know, extension specialists. Um, these are apple growers. And when they ranked the difficulty of managing the following insect pests, we had, I think, 15 different insect pests. Um, the top five are plum curculio, which is an, a native weevil pest. That's one of those persistent native pests that I was talking about. Trunk borers, which actually when we included peaches in, uh, initially we had a lot of respondents from uh, in apples and trunk borers were a little lower down on the list because of dogwood borer. Once we included more peach growers, that uh, trunk borers popped up. And a lot of that is because of the changes in um, the availability of Lorsban or chlorpyrifos insecticide, which is a was a primary management tool for that. So I think some of that may just be concern about how to manage uh, you know, peach tree borer and lesser peach tree borer as we move forward. The third most uh, difficult insect is San Jose scale, um, which is difficult to manage. And we are seeing resurgence of San Jose scale uh, in recent years, probably due to heavy pyrethroid use in our orchard systems to manage the number five pest, which is brown marmorated stink bug. Um, and then of course, the number four pest in there was codling moth, uh, which is of course the main you know, worm in the apple per se. Uh, sorry. Okay. So if we look at the injury that's caused by these pests, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, but one thing we need to keep in the back of our minds as we move forward under this kind of variable climate, and this is something that Sarah mentioned is, you know, a, a lot of these insect pests are, you know, very tightly linked with their, their host plant. And so these insect plant interactions are going to be critical as we move forward. So, you know, that some pests like plum curculio and San Jose scale, they can't develop and codling moth even, they cannot develop without their host plant. Brown marmorate stink bug, for instance, though, is such has such a wide host range. Um, it's okay if it doesn't have apple, um, but it does do very well on peach. So these kind of how the climate or variable climates are infecting the plant are also going to affect the insect. Um, how they affect that is going to be dependent on you know the specific life histories of the insect. Now, plum curculio is that adorable native weevil pest. They cause these very characteristic uh, crescent-shaped scars, oviposition scars on the fruit, and they cause um, if this is on an apple or peach early in the season, they can cause that fruit to drop. Um, if it does develop, this is obviously a reduction in the quality of the fruit at harvest. Um, and in New Jersey, uh, especially in our peaches, we can have, and this happens in cherries as well, we can have larval contamination in the fruit at harvest, depending on the time of year that that fruit is harvested. 
Trunk borers can cause tree declines and trees and exasperate tree stress. Um, and we do get our those ambrosia beetles in peaches. So the combination of those two can be very bad, especially with um, lesser peach tree borer. We, with all the, the high winds that we get, these summer derechos, uh, we can lose entire scaffolding limbs uh, if our trees are infested with, with borers. San Jose scale is a small scale pest um, and under very high pressure, it can kill trees. Uh, in fact, our entire industry was threatened uh, many years ago, decades ago, uh, by San Jose scale. And our growers, this is a picture I took last year um, in a very well-managed orchard. Um, all these red dots on there are San Jose scale. Um, this is a spotty pest because they don't uh, move very far. However, um, it's very difficult to, to manage. You need very good coverage of your insecticides. A lot of um, applications are done uh, during the dormant stage, right before bloom, um, and the variable weather conditions can make that um, difficult sometimes. Now, codling moth, again, can cause uh, larval contamination in the fruit, and it's an export issue for, um, for some of the larger producers. And then brown marmor and stink bug is an invasive species. It has a, you know, stylet mouth part, so it um, causes corking spots on the fruit, and possibly there's an association with brown rot as well. So as part of this survey that we did, we one of the questions we asked was, what do you believe is the biggest threat facing tree fruit production right now? Um, of these 100 respond, of, um, respondents, 30 said weather. Um, and weather is, you know, however you want to take it, but, you know, managing weather was the biggest threat facing tree fruit production. Uh, pests, which we grouped largely as insect disease and weeds, uh, was the third largest um, problem. But I thought this quote from anonymous Eastern tree fruit grower was really good, uh, that weather has always been an issue in agriculture, but now with climate change, I'm unsure what effects this will have on all sorts of things, including pest life cycles and the impact of beneficial organisms. And this is uh, what we're here to talk about today. So a few notes on insect populations. They're variable. Uh, I think you all know that. They are cyclical or they can just vary significantly from year to year or within a, se a season or within a generation. So it's hard to kind of look at our trends in the insect populations long term um, because we don't have a lot of long term data and because these populations are really um, variable from year to year. They are exothermic organisms, so they are dependent on weather conditions, not only for development, um, so, you know, obviously development from one life stage to the next is dependent on the temperature, but also the, um, the, the amount of heat units that they get can influence the number of generations that they have and even their abundance. So like it influences their reproductive output. Extreme weather events have more, in, the general consensus in the literature is that extreme weather events have more impact than gradual changes. So these gradual increases that we're seeing in, you know, temperature, we, we've all heard about the one to two degrees Celsius increases over, you know, periods of time. Those, the insects can evolve um, to respond to that easier than they can to these extreme weather events. They're very sensitive to drought because of a high surface to volume ratio. So they desiccate really fast. Um, they're also sensitive to extreme rainfall and they literally get washed away. So these kind of extreme weather events, you know, out of season frosts after they've already broken dormancy, um, those are are harder for insects to manage, and those are going to have greater impacts on their their um, you know within season populations. So in terms of the impacts to management, uh, we will likely see increased generations per year, and this can of course lead to increased pest pressure. We're not seeing um, a disjunct between insect life history and plant phenology. And part of that is because some of these key pests like plum curculio, oriental fruit moth, codling moth, their base temperatures are very similar to the base temperatures of tree fruit. Oriental fruit moth has a base temperature of 45 for development threshold, same as peach trees. Um, plum curculio is a base of 50 and our peach trees, you know, and apple trees warm up before that. Same thing with codling moth. So, we see we can see increased generations per year and increased pest pressure or increased abundance. 
Um, we also see a slightly earlier biofix or activity in the field. And the biofix is just when we start accumulating our degree days or monitoring for insect activity. So we're seeing these variable population densities um, and that results in variable injury. Um, a major impact to management, of course, is the available insecticides have changed. Uh, we have, although chlorpyrifos may be back in some states uh, temporarily, we are seeing um, you know, a greater adoption of mating disruption, which on the whole, I think is a really great idea. Um, and, you know, so, but our available insecticides have changed and that affects, you know, instead of going from these broad spectrum materials, uh, we are going to more um, specific chemistries and that is changing the way growers manage their orchards. Invasive species have disrupted longstanding IPM programs. And of course, brown marmorid stink bug is a really good example of this. We've been dealing with brown marmorid stink bug uh, as a pest in tree fruit since about 2010. And while the populations have declined, what we're seeing is the intense management systems that we had in place to manage brown marmorid stink bug for five to 10 years, um, which was primarily pyrethroids and um, some neonicotinoids has caused our growers to drop mating disruption. Um, and we've seen secondary pest flare-ups specifically with mites, woolly apple aphid, and San Jose scale. Um, and so now what we're seeing is kind of issues, increasing issues with San Jose scale. And then also because we've removed our insecticides, going back to Guthion even, um, you know, Guthion went away, stink bug came in. And now that stink bug programs are kind of shrinking, what we're seeing now is plum curculio being the number one pest. So we see that in my orchards, we see that in West Virginia, we're seeing that pretty much throughout the mid-Atlantic state with plum curculio considerably always rising to the top as the number one pest, pest that we're seeing. Um, and in fact, last year we didn't have any bugs except for plum curculio. Um, so when we when we ask in as part of that survey, we asked our growers to considering their their rankings from those those pests that they identified. What are what do you believe are sorry I can't read. Do you believe you have cost effective management strategies for these most difficult pests? And forty two percent said no, and another twenty four percent said I don't know. So even though we have these well established IPM programs, we still have significant gaps as growers look forward to this changing pest complex and changing climate. So I wanna talk about how climate specifically can impact our pest populations. And there's a really great paper by some colleagues of mine on great berry moth, which I know is not a tree fruit pest, but what they did is they took a, um, a model system and they did a stochastic um, stage specific phenology model on it where they predicted what would happen to the populations under two different climate uh, change scenarios. So if you look here, now codling, oh, sorry, not codling moth, <laughs> great berry moth, it is a tortricid moth. It overwinters in the um, last larval instar stage. So it's very similar to uh, codling moth and oriental fruit moth. They have between um, two and three generations per year. Uh, this was done for Pennsylvania in the Erie region. We have three generations per year of great berry moth in, in southern New Jersey. Um, so under these, you know, the low, which is an orange here predictions, you see it increase to over three generations. So we have an additional generation under the high population pressure. You can have up to three and a half or four generations in a single year. So that's not fun. <laughs> um, and if you look at the um, the observational data. So this is the current data in 2007. Um, the dashed line is the observed data from pheromone traps. Um, and then they simulated. So this just kind of shows the fit of the model over time. So this is the number of days. You can see we have these four population peaks in the traps, and that's just the overwintering population and then the successive three generations. Um, what you see here under climate change scenarios, so this is under the low emissions and then of course the high emissions, is that the population density doesn't change for this pest, but it shifts. So we're seeing those second generations shift earlier into the season. Um, as same thing with the second, third, the, the three successive generations that cause damage to the berry are shifting uh, closer together. They have more overlapping um, between the, the last two generations and 
they are shifting almost a hundred, almost 50 degree, 50 days earlier into the season. So I mentioned plum curculio is pretty much our number one pest right now. And this causes four types of injury. We have larval contamination of fruit. We have oviposition injury, feeding injury, and the fruit can drop itself. Um, so, and we see a significant loss in our fruit around June drop. Uh, basically that fruit, if it has an injure, injury and the larvae inside of it, uh, the, the tree upsizes that fruit. When we don't manage our orchards, I say we have 60% loss to, to our crop. We can get 100% loss um, in some of our orchards if they're not managed. It's the number one pest concern among New Jersey growers and some of the older surveys that our Agnello used to do said it was the number two most damaging pest in New England. Um, and it's a pest of peach, apple, pear, plum, cherry, and even blueberry. And now with that recent survey, um, it's the number one pest. It does have a pretty long life cycle and activity can last five to seven weeks. Uh, my growers used to have to do two sprays per year for Plum Curculio, we're now doing at least four. Um, so we're seeing a significant increase in the number of uh, sprays that we're putting on for Plum Curculio. The activity period has increased uh, significantly. It used to be a very short time frame that they had to manage the adults. Now it's much longer. We have a solid two generations per year in the Mid-Atlantic. In the Southeast, like in Georgia, they have at least three. Now, one thing I find really interesting is um, I'm fortunate that we have some of the trees at my uh, facility that have been there since before I was here and I have the same technician. Um, so we have historical data on injury and then severity. So severity, injury is just like the percent of fruit that is injured per tree, whereas severity is the number of feeding scars uh, or oviposition scars per fruit. And so the amount of injury hasn't really changed um, over this you know, 10 year period or 12 year period, but the severity has increased. So if you see this here, we have the period from 2002 to 2008, we had an average of about 1.4 uh, oviposition scars per fruit. In 2014, we had about 6.4. Um, now this excludes data from 2016 where we had 100% injury. Um, same thing with data from 20. 20 and 2021, where we had almost 100% injury as well. So I've excluded those major outliers. Um, and even if you exclude this big um, 2014 injury, um, we also see, I think it's about two and a half um, scars per fruit. So where something has shifted, where we're seeing um, an increase in the amount of feeding injury or oviposition injury in our plum curculio, in our fruit by plum curculio. And one thing we've done is we've gone back through all the uh, NOAA data from back to 1948 um, to 2017, where we looked at um, the number of degree days, phase 10, um, which is the minimum temperature threshold for plum curculio until uh, day 273 when you know plum curculio is not active anymore. And what I hope you can see here is not surprising. We're seeing a significant increase um, in the number of degree days on an average about 10 per year. Um, so over the course of, you know, this this period here, this 50, 60 year period, you know, we're seeing about seven, I think it's about 700 degree days uh, increase um, between our generations. So we have two generations per year and this may explain why we're seeing a longer activity period of plum curculio. And of course, this is what the larvae inside the fruit look like. So that's our cute little larvae in, developing inside the fruit. And what's really kind of um, interesting is early in the season, when you have plum curculio damage on these small fruits before pit hardening, um, it's a very obvious scar. Um, you can definitely see the injury. You can even sometimes see frass inside the fruit. When you have these mature fruit, the fruit look physiologically sound. Um, it's just when you cut that fruit open, you see the larvae. Um, and I think what's happening is that at that stage, the, you know, the, the, the fruit are fuzzy um, and the scar is just smaller because the fruit hasn't swelled in size. Um, they're, you know, just, they're just increasing in water at that size. They're not really mitotically active. Uh, my son has actually harvested uh, peaches from, you know, picked peaches, sorry, we harvest, he picks peaches uh, from 
my orchards and gone, gone, hey, mama, there's a plum curculio larvae inside of this one. So, you know, they definitely are present in our orchards uh, for the second generation. And one thing that I want to point out, too, is we've done a lot of studies, um, not only with traps, but also with protein marking. Um, and we see a very strong edge effect in New Jersey in our peach orchards. When we go to Georgia, where they have three generations per year, that edge effect goes away. So there's differences in their behavior, possibly where they're overwintering or even how they're moving to the plants. So we think our, our plum curculia are walking from the orchard edge. And in Georgia, we think that they're flying. Um, so there's a difference in their behavior as well as the number of generations. So I would expect as you guys move forward, um, not only in apples, but also in peaches that you would see some differences in the plum curculio behavior which is another thing we need to start looking at. We're seeing a lot of activity of plum curculio during the day. Uh, this was taken at like 10 a.m. Um, they're supposed to be a nocturnal insect and we see them laying eggs, we see them mating um, throughout, throughout the day, which is a little interesting. So the next pest I'm gonna talk about is brown marmot stink bug because I like this insect um, and I think it's just good uh, information about an invasive species. So of course this was first detected in the US in 1990 um, and it became a major pest problem in 2010. Um, it's an aggregate feeder. It really prefers tree fruit, especially peaches. Um, and we have we are seeing escape from natural enemies. However, our parasitism in orchards has increased. Uh, we, we are getting about, we were getting about 2% um, parasitism. Now that's increased with the um, advent of Trisulcus japonicus, which is a co-evolved egg parasitoid of brown marmot stink bug. So we are seeing declines in the populations over time, um, which is very good because it did cause a fourfold increase in insecticide use. We did some modeling. Uh, this was part of a collaborative project uh, funded by the USDA SCRI, where we had uh, a network of traps throughout, pherom aggregation pheromone traps throughout the US. And then we overlaid climate uh, climate models onto these, this demographic data. And you can see that the size of the, and color of these dots, uh, sorry, the size of the dot indicates the pest pressure. The color is from 2017, 2018, or 2019. Um, so this was a three-year study. And you can see most of these spots were, um, you know, there's a few here that we did not detect any BMSB, but most of them we have over a hundred per trap. When we look at the different climate factors that influence the occurrence, which is the Maxent model and the abundance, which is the uh, GBM model, um, the predictions vary a little bit differently, um, but we see that for occurrence, the distance to urban areas and precipitation in January strongly influence um, BMSB populations. And then for the abundance, uh, evapotranspiration, and then the combination of solar radiation and photo period, are really impactful. And that's likely because photo period is what indicates is the diapause termination cue for brown marmorid stink bug. So when we look at habitat suitability for brown marmorid stink bug under climate change scenarios, what we can see is this is the percent change um, from our current estimates under low emission uh, models. So the red area is where we see strongest percent increase in population density. And then blue is where we see the significant change, uh, decrease in population severity. So what we're gonna see is that the Southern parts are gonna be less impacted. Um, so lucky Sarah. Um, and But there are some coastal areas in California and then in the Pacific Northwest that are gonna be increasingly impacted. And also uh, moving up into New York and along um, the Great Lakes region, we're gonna see uh, increases in our um, pest pressure from brown marmorite stink bug. So another little, last little bit that I wanna include is um, at Rutgers, we have a longstanding IPM program. Um, this is from what I understand is the longest uh, university run IPM program in the, in the country. Um, so we have this long-term data set. Um, we're currently in the process of digitizing a lot of these historical records. Uh, the trap records on abundance and occurrence of our key insect pests. Um, but as you probably can guess, this is a pretty arduous task. Um, so what I've done is I've taken our 
weekly newsletter records and then some data from my research station in Bridgeton, New Jersey, and tried to figure out if over just the past 10 years, if we've seen any changes in what's being reported. So this is kind of, it's anecdotal, but it's using some hard numbers. So what we see here is um, if we look at the San Jose scale crawlers, which is the, the life stage that we monitor, that's almost always um, the end of May, beginning of June. If we look at the date, the day of the year, so this is not temperature data, this is just the day of the year for all these, these pests, we're seeing a significant decline in the day of the year that we're getting that first crawler appearance. Now, one thing is these are all very, very low R squared values. Um, so we're going about like 0 0.2, 0 0.3 R squared values. So take that with a very significant grain of salt, but we are seeing a negative trend of about, um, you know, 0.8 days per year. Uh, when we go to codling moth, which is um, a very important pest, we're seeing almost the same exact trend. Um, uh, and we're having some issues with codling moth and the biofix, not the biofix, but the codling moth uh, phenology models kind of falling apart. Um, so same thing with uh, oriental fruit moth. We're seeing a negative decrease of about one year, one day a year. Um, just And this is, again, just in the last 10, 12 years. Um, and then just to kind of tie in our plant phenology, we're seeing the same trend with full bloom in our red haven peach variety, which is kind of our industry standard for phenology model models. Um, so overall, with some of these key pests that are really tied with the host plant and you know the temperature, we are seeing a decline in or an earlier occurrence of these pests, um, which is tied also with an earlier bloom period for red haven. So looking forward, um, one thing I keep saying is we need to look at later blooming varieties um, because we're getting these frost events. Um, and you know, like Sarah, we have a very long growing season. Um, I was just telling somebody today, our growing season starts April 1st. Um, some years, like the year I moved here, it started March 15th. <laughs> uh, we were in full bloom on March 15th. So some years it's mid-April. Um, but we're seeing significant loss of fruit every about two to three years. Um, it's spotty um, due to frost events. And this impacts the insect populations, not only in that current year, but also in the future year, um, both positively and negatively. Pest distributions, of course, may move forward and pest activity may increase. We currently have two generations per year in Northern New Jersey and Southern New York. Um, so I would expect you know, there are some parts of Plum Curculio that are still univoltine, and this is um, linked to their diapause cues. So that may switch um, as they move forward, as you know, the climate becomes more suitable for those generations moving northward. Um, codling moth currently has three generations in New Jersey, but the phenology model is not as accurate, as predictive as it used to be. And of course, the next question is, what's going to be the next invasive species? So um, we have a lot of things to look forward to, and we really need more long-term data sets to really get at this question of, you know, how impact, how climate change is impacting our insect pest populations. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, both to Anne and Sarah. Um, so I've seen that there's been quite a bit of um, activity going on in the chat uh, which is great to see. Um, some folks have had questions and had them answered by Sarah um, sort of in the last half hour. We do have some time now for questions, so I would open it up for questions to both Sarah and Anne, and you can feel free even if you already had your question answered. Um, I have so many questions, so I'm going to like jump in real quick with one um, before anybody else can, and hopefully it won't take too much time. But I was really interested um, just in kind of your last sentence there, Anne, about the coddling moth phenology mm -hmm. model failing. I would really like to hear more about kind Me of what too. you mean by that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's hard to figure out where, where what's going wrong. We have... You know, we have our pheromone traps with lures that we know are attractive. We have models that work, but we also know that we have insecticide resistance to our pyrethroids. Um, and there's a bimodal peak 
of codling moth where you have the insecticide resistant population. So the timing is a little different if you have that second peak from that's the resistant population. So, but what we're seeing is we're getting no codling moth in our traps and we're getting 10 plus percent injury from that first generation per year. So, or we'll get like a couple codling moth in our traps, nothing, I mean, our growers are still managing, but we're not getting, we're not reaching threshold and then we see lots of damage. So, um, and then we're, or we'll just get kind of this continual trap trapping of codling moth. There never seems to be that like drop off that we would expect with these kind of peaks. Now, of course, we expect that with the later generations where the, you know, the models always fall apart, but it's just, it's harder and harder to time because we get these warm periods where we know that the insects have, um, they break diapause, they become active, and then we get these really cool periods, right? And Sarah mentioned these cooler nights that they're seeing uh, in North Carolina, codling moth mates at night, right? They're active at night and they're active above 55 degrees with very low winds. So that time period of activity where the trap is able to detect them, I think is, um, is I don't know if that's what's narrowing or our ability to detect them in the landscape is, is variable. Something's going on. Very interesting. I'd like yeah. to know more too. Yeah, <laughs> very cool. I, I did see a question about mating disruption. Um, I would love to see 100% mating disruption for oriental fruit moth because it's really easy to disrupt. And all of our apple orchards have oriental fruit moth as well as codling moth. Um, we are getting over, I think 75% of our growers have adopted mating disruption for borers. Um, probably up to 100% now with the loss of lore's man. Um, Codling moth and oriental fruit moth is highly variable. It depends a little bit more on what else is going on. And because plum curculio is a major problem and they're having to spray for, for plum curculio no matter what, it changes their thought process on that. So it's something we're trying to figure out how better to increase adoption of mating disruption and what those barriers are. If anybody else wants to unmute at any point, I don't want to hog all the question time. Um, I can keep going, but everybody feel free to unmute or stick it in the chat, whichever you feel more comfortable with. And I've got a question about Plum Curculio. Okay. You said they were spraying twice a year, and I assume that was in the, you know, the three to four weeks after petal fall. Mm-hmm. So when are those extra applications gone on? Is that because you now have a second full generation of PC that you spray for in August or? No, so we're not. So that's a very good question. Thank you for that. So the additional applications are against the first generation. The activity period has, has just extended. So, but hand in hand with that, we've had the loss of Guthion. Uh, I mean, that, and that I know that's going back 10 years, but we've had the loss of some of these materials that were just really, really effective at controlling plum curculio. So it's this interaction of loss of chemicals that just were able to knock down those populations and an increased activity period. So we're, we're spraying through, let's just say petal falls May 1st, we're spraying all the way through late, through uh, Memorial Day. So are you saying that the New York degree day model, you know, 305 degree days, base 50, they should be pooped out. Mm -hmm. That doesn't apply anymore? It's falling apart for us. Uh -huh. So, I mean, I think the time, the stop point is okay. It's just that that activity, we're like, we're having to spray every week instead of every two weeks. So it's more frequent. It's not a longer durate. Well, it's both. Well, it's both. Okay. So, but we are, we are extending it further out too. Um, so we're still trying to figure out some of this data. We've looked at the degree days quite a bit for Plum Curculio. And the problem is like, at first we had what we thought was a really great phenology model. And then, you know, we, we published it on our plant pest advisory. We were excited about it. And the next year it fell apart. So 
it wasn't matching up. But this our the phenology model for the southern strain is what works best for us. And that the phenology model you're discussing is for apples for the northern strain. Okay. But in answer to your question about the second generation, our growers are not specifically targeting the second generation of plum curculio because it's being controlled by stink bug sprays, generally. Well, they think it's being controlled by stink bug sprays. And then, well, one more, unless somebody else wants to jump in, but I didn't see apple maggot on your pest rankings at all. Yep. Surprises me. Me too. Um, so this had New York growers, it had Michigan growers, Wisconsin growers, um, West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, um, all the states in between, Pennsylvania. Um, for my growers in New Jersey, apple maggot's not a major problem. Um, I don't know why. I'm okay with that though. <laughs> um, so I don't know what we what we failed to do, and we kind of thought about this afterwards was a you know identification of the state uh, our respondents were from to see if that if there were specific trends within each state. So I'm not saying apple maggot's not a problem. It was on the list. I just so we could read it, I, I, I trimmed it down, um, but it, it is on the list. It's just not in the top five. Following up on that, actually, one of my questions was similarly, um, if, if I was to do like a gut sense of where my growers would have ranked those, I would have put woolly apple aphid almost at the top this year. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think, is that a New York problem or is that just something that didn't filter up for some reason? I think it just didn't filter up. Um, and this, remember the question was not what's the number one pest, it's which one do you, are you having management failures with? So that changes the question a little bit. Like for us, um, in my apple orchards up North, woolly apple aphid is problematic, but it's spotty. So not every orchard has them within the same grower. Um, so I don't know if it's just not a, you know, like everybody has plum curculio problems. Everybody's having scale problems. Cool. Interesting data set. Definitely. Does anybody else, I can, I can keep going with questions, but if anybody else has any, um, give you guys a moment to jump in. I see Kathleen's question about, um, multiple curculio egg laying. I think you're asking about that severity question. Um, so the severity is the number of egg scars per fruit. And yes, we're seeing a significant, like a fourfold increase in, in, in that. Maybe fine. I don't know if this was part of her question, but do you think that that's, I don't know enough about plum curculio. Is that one female that's laying multiple times on a single fruit or is that multiple females? It's multiple coming? females. Yeah. They each one would just lay once. Yeah. One year we had in 2016, we had a frost event and we had very low fruit. So we just kind of decided to, to um, pick a lot of the fruit that we had and see how many egg scars we had. And these are the June drop fruits. So they're the really tiny ones. And so we counted the number of scars we had and the number of larvae that we got per fruit. And these were in Fantasia nectarines. We had an average of 50 scars per fruit and an average of six larvae that came out of each one. Now back back in when Ron was first starting doing the work on Curculio, he always said it was really hard to get more than one, you know, mm -hmm. egg laid in a fruit. And just in the last year or two, that seems to be it. I've seen it in the in the when when they get when the fruits start to get really big, uh, I get what they call what I started calling Kurt Berserk when you get like 20 or 30 mm -hmm. uh, stings per fruit. And I I I'm guessing that just has to do with the size of the fruit. But but what I've been just seeing, you know, probably this year, last year, last couple of years is, you know, suddenly we're seeing multiple actual egg laying per fruit. So I just yeah, I, th I just thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of that. Like, I mean, even on grower farms, you know, commercial orchards, we're seeing fruit with multiple multiple of a position scars. And, uh, you know, I, I have to admit, we don't have great data on the second generation damage because it's one of those things we're assessing fruit for something else entirely, codling moth or stink bug or scale. And then we start kind of, are we recording plum curculio? And then we record it 
and but we don't distinguish old scars versus fresh scars and so the data is hard to distinguish um between that but we we have looked at data where we've um you know managed against that second generation and we do see a difference we do see a, a decrease about 10 percent There was another question in there about stink bug. Um, I think it was products. Oh, everything. What insecticides do you use on stink bugs? We use everything. Um, we use a lot of Actara, um, thiomethoxam. Um, well, we don't use a lot of it. We're restricted in the number of uses we have. Um, Bathroid, sorry, Belay, um, at the higher rate, six ounces, uh, is also effective. And then we we actually my growers use a lot of Warrior um, because it's cheap. Um, so, but and anything that works is what we'll use. Perfect. There was. Oh, are you going to ask your question uh, for Sarah? Go on. I was. Sarah's there, there still there, right? I'm here. Yeah, you. Glenn also okay. has a question. So, so Sarah, I was wondering, are you seeing any Marcinina uh, leaf blotch in North Carolina? We're seeing a ton of Marcinina leaf blotch in, in North Carolina. And um, yeah, I mean, we haven't seen as much fruit injury as maybe you've actually seen up north. It's a lot of leaf injury and we'll start to see symptoms July or so. So the game with the Marcinina is that I'm not aiming for 100% control on that. I'm aiming for, you know, let's keep the leaves on the trees so that number one, we can continue to have quality fruit. I guess that's the main reason, right? So, so yeah, what we found is that, you know, the captan itself doesn't, or Mancozep regimen doesn't really seem to do great control for that. Where we're targeting Marcinina is we can actually get very good control. I would say at least 80% control um, with Marcin, of Marcinina on a regular apple scab um, spray schedule, quite frankly. And there's been many years I've cut my sprayer off in, in Rome Beauty where we do those trials of second cover. And still very little Marcinina at that point. So we actually target it um, early on in the season or earlier in the season, I would say. And if we can hit that primary inoculum, we, we, we tend not to see all that much of it, quite frankly. Um, we did do some work with biologicals this year, Howler and, and Thea, um, rotated with Sevia. And those were on 14-day intervals. And, you know, what we found is that, you know, we can apply Sevia once a month, basically, and we can get control. So basically with Sevia Howler, Sevia Howler on um, on 14 day intervals and got great control. So that's really encouraging from a biological standpoint and IPM standpoint as well. Um, so so yeah, it, it's been a problem, particularly with processing growers who grow a lot of Rome Beauty, which is highly susceptible here and uh, don't spray as often, I would say. So So yeah. And then going to Glenn's question about sunburn, yeah, we see sunburn here. I don't work very much on sunburn. We tend to see some rots that are associated with it for sure. Um, you know, I've done some work with Prechade and some other, with with um, Surround, just to see if we can even lower the temperature of the fruit. I was curious, you know, from an infection standpoint um, of Colototricum. But no, I mean, they see it here. I don't get too many calls myself about it, though. So I want to be respectful for everyone's time. Um, so I think maybe we will cut you all off there. Um, hopefully everybody knows how to get in touch with both Sarah and Anne. Would you guys be okay if I um, put your contact information in the follow-up email? Of course. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much um, for taking the time to join us. Really um, interesting, informative. Um, definitely enjoyed it. And I did record this. I'll be sending the recording out to the group. I'll include you guys on that as well, um, if that's of use to you for any reason. So wonderful, thank you. I wanna give a really quick plug that our next um, next meeting in this series will be on the February 20th. So I think that's three weeks from now. And that will be talking about um, current trends and outlooks for protected culture production. So um, make sure to join us for that same link. And then also there was a question about mating disruption and that's a great segue into um, Tuesday, March 5th. We're going to have another um, one of these conversations talking specifically about mating disruption. So hopefully you guys can all join us those. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, take Thank care. Thank you.